Uh, thank you, Matthew. Um, I, uh, I started the book with probably, uh, I started the book with a love letter. And in a sense, you know, my feelings about large corporations go back to the age of 18, where I was packing chocolates uh, at Terry's in York. In fact, Matthew and I were just speaking about that in a, a moment ago. And of course, you know, it isn't, it's sort of fashionable to knock large corporations, but the truth is that all of us consume their electricity, we drink their water, we fly in their, their planes, we, we buy their insurance. And although one can argue that uh, large corporations are doomed. There isn't any evidence of that. There's no evidence that large corporations are getting smaller or there's fewer of them. In fact, there's more of them and they're getting larger. So what I wanted to address in the book was what expectations can we have of them? And that's, in a sense, why I started it with this idea of, of the love letter. And, you know, I think that the question of expectations is particularly prescient at the moment because... Um, we live in a world which is changing very fast, and that's been actually the focus of my research now for 10 years. For 10 years, I've been working with uh, people from a, a whole bunch of companies, and, and these are they, uh, about the future of work. And what's interesting, I think, about this research consortium that I've been leading is it's both international, and that's important because some of the most interesting ideas are coming from places in the world you wouldn't have expected. And it covers different sectors. And that's also interesting because different sectors uh, have different ways of looking at the world. Now, when we think about the future, uh, there's lots of ways of talking about it. But, but I've specifically uh, talked about and described these trends. And just to, to pull a few of them out, I mean, what we know about the future is incredible levels of connectivity. Um, what we know about the future is profound changes in the nature of work, particularly what some have called the hollowing out of work, which sees most medium skilled jobs either being outsourced or uh, being replaced by technology. A future where uh, the, uh, the world that we've produced uh, is now creating problems both in terms of poverty and in terms of, of climate change. And when you think about that, when I think about that, I ask two questions. One was, what would I tell my children? What would I advise my kids and my friends? And the second is, what would I say to corporations? And I wrote a book called The Shift, which was really about what would we tell our children? What, what would we say to them about how we live and how they might live and how they might come to terms with the world that they're facing? But because my interest since the age of 18 has been large corporations, both working within them and for the last 23 years researching them, uh, I, the second question was, what would we tell those companies? What would we say to Unilever? What could one say to Arm? What would one say to Tata Consulting Services? And it seems to me that all that one can say, and by the way, it's the same as you say to people, is it's about resilience. We don't know what the future is going to be, but what we do know is it's going to change faster than anything that's happened before. And we do know that large institutions have an enormously important role to play. Now, it's easy to diss them. It's easy to say they're greedy, they're short-term, and all those things are true. But it's much more than that, because actually, large institutions are made up of people like you and I. In fact, some of you in this audience work for a large corporation, and you care about, about life, you care about the world, you care about things. I'm, I'm a humanistic psychologist. I believe that most of us are good. And I think most of us want to be in corporations that do good. And rather than dissing them, my question would be, can we ask more of you? And that's really where I come out in terms of preparing for the future. So what might we ask of companies? Well, I'm formulating it in three ways. First of all, we can ask of businesses that they help every single person within their organization to be the best they can be and to be as resilient as they can be. I, I dedicated this book, by the way, to Charles Handy, who's, of course, a great friend of the RSA and probably a friend of some of you here in the audience. And he has talked about this area in a great deal 
of depth and continues to do so. Uh, and I think that organizations have to think about that from the inside out. So it starts with strong, resilient corporations made up of strong, resilient people. Is that enough? Well, every single book I've, I've written in the past stops there. I I'm not a sustainability expert. Uh, I'm not an expert in supply chain management. I'm actually an expert in organizational practices and processes. But the truth is that when one looks at corporations and one looks at the future, it's sort of self-evident that corporations have to be, do more than that. Big business has to be bigger than just business. And what would that be? Well, it's about the way that they anchor themselves in their physical communities, and it's the way that they address some of the large complex problems that we solve. Now, let me start by saying a little bit about what I mean by inner resilience. Um, it seems to me that there are three things that make every one of us resilient. One of those things is about the way we think about, the way we develop ourselves intellectually in terms of our wisdom. The second is about the way we keep ourselves emotionally strong and vital, incredibly difficult in today's world, you know, when so many of us are under such levels of stress. And the third is about how we connect with each other because we know that innovation, a number of you in this room are fascinated by innovation, Innovation comes through connectivity. It comes through different people connecting together and having great ideas. So how do companies do that? Well, let, let me give you some ideas about what I see. Let's think first about how you harness the crowd. Now, I and others, Gary Hamill, many of you know, was in London, uh, is in London actually right now, and, and, and Gary and, and others have talked about how organizations become more democratic. But the truth is, and in fact, I wrote a book called The Democratic Enterprise about 15 years ago, but the truth is, it's incredibly difficult for companies to be democratic because they're hierarchies. But actually, the very forces that are changing our world, particularly technology, are also changing hierarchies. And I think they're changing them really profoundly. So here's Tata Consult Consulting Services, uh, a company that currently employs 360,000 people and that grows at 20% a year. This is a serious player. And what Chandra, who runs TCS, has said is, I want everyone to be connected to every single person, and I would like ideas to flow. We've been watching that experiment now for five years, and I've written about it quite a lot in my blogs and, and, and so on. He is actually achieving that. I mean, there are 3,000 communities of people in TCS who are talking to each other. There are 40,000 people who are coming in every day to talk. Next year, he's going to ban email. Why? Because email is hierarchical. He's actually going to say, I want everybody to talk to everybody else. I don't want it to be a hierarchy. So, number one, Let's think about how we really build the wisdom of the crowd, something we've been talking about for years but have never been able to achieve. Number two, let's think about emotional vitality. Um, you know, one thing that I notice, I teach at London Business School, so I teach both MBAs and executives. Levels of stress are really high. That's not just about big business. Anybody who's working these days is stressed. So, and what we know is that people who are stressed are less resilient. That's a big deal if you think you're going to live 100 years, which many of our children will. Uh, we've got to find a way of dealing with that. We've got to find a way of creating work that isn't so exhausting. How do you do that? Well, again, here's an idea. Here's W.L. Gore, and you don't know the name, but you probably know Gore-Tex which has said, let's really think about vitality in our organization. Let's really think about how you would give people time to do innovative, creative things. Google, by the way, of course, does the same with their 20%. Um, we can create places where people feel vital, where people feel energized. It is possible for, for us to do that. And we can also create places with high levels of connectivity. Um, I guess many of us, and certainly I, are watching technology very, very carefully at the moment. And what's very clear is that if large corporations 
will change, and I think they will. It will be technology that does that. It will be connectivity that does that. How are they going to do that? Well, here's a company uh, you may not have heard of. It's based in California. It's called Morningstar. It uh, is the largest packer of tomatoes in the world. What does it do? Well, it actually uses social networks as a way of thinking about how work gets done. And the picture I have up here shows uh, people, shown here as colored dots, and the commitments they've made to each other about what they're going to do. This isn't a hierarchy, although there are leaders and there are tasks and there are goals, but this is an organization which is connecting people with each other. These things are possible, and every one of us now needs to say to large corporations, who I think are not going to disappear, these are some of the things that you can do. Is that enough? Well, most of the research I've done and books that I've written, that would be the end. I would at that stage say, job done. But of course, you know, as you begin to think about the future, what's clear is that couldn't possibly be where you stopped. It couldn't possibly be where the job finishes. And the job doesn't finish there. The job also goes right into the community. And it really says, what are you doing in your community uh, to anchor yourself, both in your community and in your supply chain? And corporations around the world are working hard to do that. We can just look down the road at John Lewis Partnership, one of uh, the UK's iconic corporations, and by the way, increasingly admired around the world, both in terms of the way it set itself up as a, cooper uh, as a cooperative, well, as, as partnership owned, and indeed, in terms of the way it's balanced, how it tries to create social good with its uh, capacity to remain economically vibrant. It's, very, it's a very fascinating case right now. And here's John Lewis' partnership that says, the community really matters to us. It's not just about what happens in our office. It's not just about what happens in our factories. It's also about what happens in our community and what happens in our supply chain. And in the past, those supply chains have often been invisible. But again, partly because of technology, your supply chain is no longer visible. There's always going to be somebody with a camera phone who takes a photograph of pretty much everything you do and posts it and joins up with other people. And in some cases, like the Bucket Brigade, who actually are brigades of people who measure the water that's coming out of your business in terms of pollution, they're using pretty sophisticated technology to do that. So, you know, the days of everything being hidden are really well over. But does it end there? Now, the global challenges that we face are obvious to everyone. You know, it is. We, we have produced a society where the difference between the rich and the poor is extraordinary. We have produced a, society, a, a world where... Climate change, I think, is now understood by everyone. I, I don't think there's anybody now around the world who would be skeptical about that. We have produced a world where many young people, particularly in, in, in some of the European countries, are unemployed, and we know the impact that that has on their long-term health and vitality. Now, whose job is that to do something about it? Now, when you look at the, the candidates... The stakeholders, they are many and various. And of course, one can look and say it's all about government. I mean, why can't government do something about that? But what we know is that governments are based in countries. They don't go across countries. And they are cons constantly, if they're a democracy, beholden to short-term voter sentiments. Uh, you could say, well, what about NGOs? Well, well NGOs are brilliant, but the, at the same time, they find it very difficult to scale. You could say, well, what about citizens? Well, of course, citizens can join themselves together, but do they have the resources? Now, I'm not saying that the world's problems can be solved by large corporations, by big business, but what I am saying 
is that we can and should hold them uh, accountable for, for some of these issues and ask them to help. Because if any of these issues are going to be solved, and the chances, as we know, are, are, are slim because they're so complex, they will be solved because people build alliances. And one of the key parts of that alliance are large corporations, like some of the ones that you work with. Now, what is it that companies can do? Well, it's easy to say they can give money, they can give time. I don't think that's enough. Um, if you are thinking about the strategy of corporations, then you know that there is such a notion of core competencies. The idea that corporations, when they get large, usually get large because they're good at something. And typically, they're good at one of three things. You know, some of them are brilliant at innovation. Some of them are incredible. So Google, for example. Some of them are incredible at scaling and mobilizing. Take Unilever, for example. Some of them are very good at building alliances. You know, the alliances that the telecom industry builds are some of the most complex ecosystems in the world. Why can't they use those capabilities to make a difference to the problems of the world. Well, they are beginning to do that. And let me give you some examples. Now, I'm not saying that this is enough, or I'm, and I'm not saying it's going to solve all the problems, but it is the beginning. And let's take a look at what some of those beginnings are. Here's Google, who knows through its networks where some of the uh, people who are working in gang violence live, and who are reaching out, of the, out to them to encourage people in gangs to leave gangs and to become nonviolent. And they have, over years now, built, in a pretty low-key way, a network of people who have left violent gangs to help others do the same. Here's Standard Charter Bank, um, who many years ago said, one of the things in developing countries like Africa that, cre that creates problems is blindness. When a member of a, of a family is blind, it has a massive economic impact. Could we do something about that? Well, they have enormous scaling and mobilizing capabilities. You know, they have retail banks all over Africa and Asia, for example. Since they made that promise, they and their NGO partners have saved the sight of more than 31 million people. That's a lot of people. And that's because Standard Charter Bank are brilliant at scaling and mobilizing. Or let's take uh, Partners in Food Solutions, which is a whole alliance made, by the way, of competing companies who are working together to share, using technological platforms, to share their best practices and to work with NGOs who are working on food and food sustainability. Now, what does that mean for leadership? Of course, for me, that's a really important question because I teach MBA students, and some of them will become leaders. And so I've had to address that in my own thinking and indeed in my own teaching. I want to make two uh, points before I finish. Number one, it's hard to be a leader right now. I asked my MBA class some years ago, how many of you want to be CEOs? There weren't that many raised hands in the audience. Um, these are tough jobs. Uh, but I think there's something one can do to help the development of them. And basically, what I want to suggest is through the, the toughness that they face, there are two areas that I think are absolutely crucial in terms of what it means to be a leader. Number one is about the leader's relationship with themselves. I call that the inner journey. How do they uh, think about themselves? How do they think about the decisions they're going to make? Uh, and we are beginning to see around the world organizations that are thinking very hard about the way a leader thinks about themselves. Uh, and that, in a sense, is about authenticity. Because if you're running a company, you're under enormous pressure. You're going to be asked to make decisions all the time. How do you do that uh, and still hold on to your values? Well, you do it because your values are strong and they're embedded, and, and that's about authenticity. But, but that's a sort of an inward-looking focus. It seems to me 
that the second major focus is what we might call the outer journey. And by the outer journey, I mean, how is it that people who will be leading our organizations, either as CEOs or as business heads or, or as business leaders, how do they understand the world that they live in? How do they understand uh, the challenges they face? How do they understand the stakeholders that are involved? How do they make a, 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 a decision about the systems that they're creating? And, you know, those things, uh, building authenticity through their own knowledge and through the sort of experiences that act as crucibles, uh, creating a worldview in terms of their foresight and in terms of their notion, understanding of alliances, I believe is what leadership will be increasingly about. And that's really, in a sense, where I want to finish today. And I want to finish today by saying it's easy to knock corporations. I mean, I launched the book uh, a week and a half ago, and I've been on a sort of book tour to Asia since then. And, and I can tell you there's a lot of knocking going on, and I understand that. There's so many good reason, reasons to knock corporations. And yet, at the same time, we use them every moment of the day, constantly. So rather than knocking them, why don't we ask more of them? And that's why I started the book with a love letter. Thanks very much. Thank you, Linda, and thank you for, for the book, which I enjoyed enormously. But um, you, you, you ended almost with an invitation to be sceptical, so I shall take up that uh, 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 invitation. Let, let's just start with large organizations themselves. There is a view that it is increasingly difficult for large organizations, because they are large, to cope with the modern world. That they, uh, 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 As one person put it, that the pace of change outside large organizations is faster than those organizations are able themselves to change. So do you recognize that there are structural problems about largeness in the modern world? Oh, absolutely. In fact, <laughs> the book I'm writing at the moment is about the 100 years life, and the thing that changes the most are individuals. So it's the smallest unit that changes the fastest. If you actually look at where the major changes have been, I mean, for example, our attitude to homosexuality and so on, that's changed enormously. So the smaller the unit, the easier the change. No question about that. Does that mean that large corporations shouldn't be there and can't change? I, I think they can change. Uh, but they change because individuals within it change. Are there structural problems to organizations changing? Ten years ago, I would have said yes. But I do think that technological connectivity will transform companies. And the reason that I look at companies around the world and I look at them in different sectors is because you get a view of early adopters. So if you look at TCS right now, um, 360,000 people growing at 20%, that's a lot of growth. It is agile. And it's agile because it can connect people with each other. So I think that large corporations will increasingly become agile because of the speed of connectivity that technology you know, has, has provided for them. So I find that's very interesting that this whole notion of agile has become a kind of buzzword in the corporate sector. And lots of people go around uh, as consultants on how it is you become agile. And you think it's now starting to kind of work, that organizations are actually becoming more agile. It's not just an aspiration, it's not just a cry for help, but it's really, it is happening. They're becoming more fleet of foot, more responsive, more adaptable. It, it, yeah, I mean, some are and some aren't. You know, it's hard, it's just like, you know, if we were to make any generalization about everyone in this room, it'd be hard. I mean, some aren't moving at all, and they're protected because they have monopoly situations or so on. So, I mean, there's some corporations that aren't moving, and some of you may be members of such corporations. But I think in general, I, I see two things happening, Matthew. The first is I see technological change, and the second is I see a new generation of CEOs. I've been, um, I've been you know, watching companies now for, for many years, and, uh, and of course, at London Business School, we've been educating. I've been teaching people now for 25 years, and uh, you know, a number of the people I taught 20 years ago are now CEOs in their 40s. And I do think that there are 
there are a group of CEOs, and you know, Paul Polman is one of them, who do want to make a difference and who do think that organizations should be agile. But I, I don't think, I think one should be, um, you know, realizing what large companies do. I mean, what large companies are really good at is delivering shampoo and soap and to every, to, you know, to a billion people. Small companies can't do that. But what large companies really fail to do often is to innovate. Um, and there's all sorts of reasons why they fail to innovate. But, but what you then think about is a large company as an ecosystem. So if you look at Unilever or P&G or Google these days, they don't innovate themselves. But what they're very good at is spotting small companies that can innovate and either buying them or um, bringing them into their ecosystem. So I think what you're getting now with the current crop of CEOs is a pretty sophisticated understanding of what company, large companies are good at. Google, finding the best people in the world. Unilever, scaling and mobilizing. Uh, but also realizing what they're not so good at and you know, building strategies around that. When I was reading the final chapters of the book, uh, which is where your talk ended up, these notions of worldview and authentic leadership, and some very, very powerful stuff there, case studies, quotes. But I was a little bit reminded of uh, Richard Sennett's book from a few years ago, The Corrosion of Character, in which Sennett argued that, that the problem with the modern corporation is that it's very good at talking about mission and team and uh, commitment and all this kind of stuff. But when things get tough, people get sacked. And all that stuff doesn't yeah. really mean a great deal. And then they see that at the same time as their colleagues are getting sacked, the chief executive is doubling their salary. So that there's a kind of disconnect between this language, yeah. which is kind of new way, it's sort of new age-ish almost, yeah. and the kind of quite hard reality of the decisions that corporates actually make and the kind of way in which those realities differentially impact across the pyramid of the organization? Well, you know, you know corporations aren't play, play pits any more than universities are or families are. I mean, you know, families, universities, corporations are faced with really tough decisions on a regular basis, and they have to make those decisions. I mean, there isn't a, there isn't a, a company, however small or however large it, in the world, that can keep underperformers in place. I, I mean, you can't do that because your company suffers. So it doesn't matter how big you are. There are some people in your corporation that you have to let go of. So uh, I don't have a problem with companies doing tough things. But isn't the problem that you see that... I do actually have a problem with CEO pay, though. Oh, right. Well, <laughs> but, but isn't that the problem that, that when one talks about notions of authenticity and empathy and, and collaboration... I mean, when it comes to... Fr those are the kind of words you might use about friendship. Now, I don't dump my friends because they underperform. You know, I kind of yeah. persist with them even when they're having a hard time. But if you're in a corporation, you use all that language, yeah, but, but then the but, stock market turns against you and 500 but people... Matthew, it's the disconnect. you wouldn't trust that friend who underperforms. You might like them, but you don't trust I'm, them. I'd keep them because they make me feel better about myself, actually. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so, 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 you, so you like your friends, but... I mean, I have friends I absolutely adore, adore, but I wouldn't trust them. I wouldn't trust them... For example, to get here today, and I can see from who's in the audience, I've got some friends who absolutely promised to be here, and they're not here, including my son, actually, who I suppose is sort of a relative rather than a friend. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, issue, the issue of trust and, uh, and liking are entirely different issues. And, and I think, you know, but having said that, we know that for many people, you know, work is where they make all their friends. Uh, so there is often an, uh, you know, there is often a, um, an overlap of that. But I don't, I don't think that should be an issue. Uh, of course, you have to manage performance. You have to, you have to manage performance at the RSA. Well, why would it be different for a large corporation? I suppose, I'm, I suppose, in a way, what I'm saying is that this kind of balance of soft and hard is part of what's the challenge for the modern is, chief executive because they've is. got to be an authentic visionary leader who is yeah. warm and you've yeah. you talk in your book about the needing to be open and vulnerable I, about I themselves used, but then I, sometimes they've got to be hard bastards. I never use the word warm by the way. I, d I don't think so. But you talk about their vulnerability, you talk about yes. them. Yes, yeah? but the, the, are you, I would use the word authenticity. So one of the people I talk about is Paul Polman and as part of writing that, you know, one of the challenges of writing books is that you write a book and then the CEOs you mention get sacked or the companies that you, that you talk about go under. And 
I can tell you there's been quite a lot of those. So as part of thinking about the book, I did go and make sure that the companies that I talked about at least would be in place by the time of publication. And as part of that, due diligence, I talked to quite a lot of people who know Paul Polman. And they actually said, he's really hard. Now, Paul, by the way, is the poster child for CEOs these days because the, what he's done with sustainability is really, really extraordinary. I mean, he has got Unilever to reduce its carbon footprint by 50%. And he did that through scaling and mobilizing in a way that a small company could not do in a million years. He's hard. So I don't think, I, I, in the book, I don't use the word soft. I don't think leadership is about being soft. I think it's about being determined, purposeful, and performance orientated. Final question before I open it up. In a pride before a fall, there is a kind of sense that when organizations become very, very powerful, feel that they can rule the world, that is a, a kind of canary in the mind for the fact that things are going to go wrong. That's, I think, how it feels now, looking back on it, about banks a yeah. few years ago. They thought they were masters of the universe, and as yeah. it turned out, yeah. they were not. Is that how we should feel about the big technology giants now, Google, Amazon, Facebook, that they too are these enormous organizations. They're quite different to the corporations that you mainly mm. talked about because mm. you talked about corporations that are geographically grounded. They're not geographically grounded at mm. all. They're all around us, but they don't live in, with us or amongst yeah. us. Yeah. Uh, they're relatively small in terms of the number of employees yeah. in comparison. I think if you add all those three together, they've got fewer employees than General Motors had in the 1970s, yeah. for example. Yeah. Um, and they're incredibly intrusive. You know, yeah. they know more yeah. about us than we know about ourselves a lot of the time. Do you think that those kind of corporations are doing enough thinking about the danger of overreach in relation to public legitimacy? I think that's an incredibly important question. And I, and I think the question you've raised, Matthew, is, is a question not just about corporations. It's a question about our society. I remember... Um, when I bought my iPhone, the first thing I did, because I had the new one where you put your thumb, thumbprint on, and I put my thumbprint on, and my youngest son said to me, Mom, you've just given away your thumbprint. What are you doing? And it didn't even occur to me that I now, that data has been, now been collected, and I was interviewing the CEO of Vodafone recently and, um, uh, for London Business School, and I asked him, what's the thing that's most on your mind? And he said exactly that. He said, you realize that there are technology companies that now know everything about you and we have no idea what they're going to do with that data. I totally agree with you. And I, but I don't think it's about corporations. I think it's about humanity and technology. We have incredibly complex challenges up ahead of us in terms of how we use technology, how we use privacy. And I think that we do need a really important debate about that. And I would rather have strong, strong thoughtful corporations thinking about that than ones that are running away. But I totally agree with and you. Do you think those, those corporations, these big tech, are, are, is your sense that they are thinking deeply enough about it? I have no idea. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to say, to say that in a bland way. It's, it's difficult to know to what extent they are. Um, because, because I suppose the reason why I say that, and I, I'm going to open it up, but... Yeah. We had a, a couple of other authors here yeah. last year talking about corporations that have made a change. Yeah. And one of the things they said was that the corporations that have most profoundly changed, there is a common theme, and that is a reputational disaster at some point in the past, a turning point, a yeah. moment when, yeah. you know, I think, for example, they quote Nike, Nike where, yeah. you know, for years they held off and said, our supply chain has nothing to do with us. Yeah. And then the chief executive has a kind of mea culpa moment and says, no, yeah. we take total responsibility for our supply chain. And now they're just about the best in the world in terms yeah. of what they became about the best in the world yeah. for that. So... I guess the point is, do these companies, in the end, it has to get to the point at which they suffer a massive reputational problem before they're willing to think deeply enough about these things? I mean, again, you know, corporations are rather similar to individuals in the sense that none of us change unless we have huge problems. I mean, that's, you know, I speak as a psychologist, you know, which one of us in this room has ever changed until something really bad or difficult has happened to us, either a fateful thing or something we've noticed ourselves. So, I, it doesn't surprise me that organizations find it difficult to change. In fact, I'm surprised that we ever thought they would be able to change because that's not how we humans are built. I mean, we humans are actually built for continuity. So the institutions that we build are also built for continuity. And, and I agree with you that sometimes it's a real challenge that makes them change, which is why, and I haven't said this a great deal in the book and perhaps I should have done, 
I do think that you as employees and as citizens should be very vigilant about corporations and you should you know, ask something of them uh, and, and demand because that's how, you're right, I mean in a sense that's how change happens and, and the, more that you can sh you, the more that you can provide corporations with feedback, then the more likely they are to change because corporations like people are not natural change processes. Great. Let's take two or three questions together. Oh, we've got a Twitter question here, which I always like, because it demonstrates we're in the 21st century. Uh, <laughs> okay, this, this Twitter question comes from Michael King, who asks, I guess a large percentage of your MBA students would like to work in startups. Can big corporations really innovate and act like startups? No, no, they can't. Um, Good, next question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. No, in fact, um, we had yesterday at London Business School our big sort of annual event where we got lots of our alumni together and, and quite a few of the strategy professors. And that was a big question. The, the, the whole day was about technology. And I think the general feeling is it's incredibly difficult for large corporations to, inno to, to really innovate in the way that startups can. But what they are good at is finding those startups, partnering those with those startups, buying those startups. Um, and creating ecosystems, and that some of them, P&G, for example, GE, Google, are absolutely brilliant at that. But it is hard to innovate because large corporations are built for for reliability. Okay. Yep. Hi, I'm Jonathan Jewell. I'm a lecturer with the Open University. Uh, so I'm going to ask you a question that possibly relates to London Business School, but it's not the classic uh, attack on uh, you know, how much you stand up for your own values. Um, I think education is big business. I'm not sure if it classifies as big enough business to meet your requirements in terms of corporations and big business. So uh, is that okay to ask that question or is sure. it? Uh, okay. Sure. So I, I mean, uh, universities generally, I'm not talking about either of ours, they are often sort of like seen as slow movers, potentially mm -hmm. ivory towers. They also, I guess, uh, can get away to some extent by saying our corporate social responsibility is that we educate people and that's going to change the world and the future and everything like that. But thinking about it, I'm just wondering uh, whether individual universities, I'm thinking about things like Harvard Business School, uh, LBS, Manchester Business School and things like that, Open University Business School, or potentially the, the larger structures like Russell Group or the mm -hmm. Ivy League. Um, are these institutions showing that kind of change with them? Are they um, not just propagating that outwards, but are they sort of changing in a way that's so good that this is becoming something about modern day education? Um, and I know the Open University kind of possibly has an advantage in that it does distance education, but I generally. Can see Matthew closing no, it yeah, down. Fine. Yeah, that was, that was are it. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah no, fine. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're he's, finished. he's finished. No. Yeah, no, yeah. That's, thank you so much for that question. No, that's a really interesting question. Um, well, our world is about to be disrupted. And, and, and the, the general view is we, there's a whole bunch of people, including me, who are in a group, actually, who are looking at disruption of education, and we think it's five years. Uh, and it's being disrupted through technology. So, so for example, my, my younger son, um, Dominic, when he was uh, preparing to, to try and get into medical college, he needed to have very high scores in physics. And, uh, and he learnt his physics from the best physics teacher in the world. Well guess what, the best physics teacher in the world is at MIT. He's not in any of the, the London schools. And he's put every single one of his uh, um, lectures online, and anyone can look at them, and, and that's how Dom learnt physics. And, and actually, one of the startling events at Davos last year, for me anyway, was to see you know, the usual Davos group with a 13-year-old Pakistani girl. And she was there because one of the Stanford professors who was also with her had put his course online, but more than the MIT group, he'd also put the examination process online. And she was the 13-year-old, you know this, from Lahore. Um, why was she there? She came top. Uh, she came top at Stanford. So, you know, we are about to hit our wall in education. Are we prepared at LBS? Absolutely not. You probably are a lot more than we are, actually, because you've been running virtual classrooms for years. But, and I think it's about time we changed. I think it's astounding that, that we're all educating people in exactly the same way as we did 10 years ago. I'm, I'm appalled, really. And, uh, 
Um, yeah, it, we will. You're, thank you so much for that question. Yeah. What do you mean by compulsory? I don't know. I, I, I guess so, yeah, because, you know, again, it's, da it's down to technology, really. That uh, um, One of the questions I ask uh, around the world is, what's the youngest child that you know who uses an iPad? Well, the youngest I've got was in Kuwait a few weeks ago when somebody put their hand up and said, 10 months. Now, 10 months means they're neither walking nor talking or really doing anything. Now, that kid's brain is being rewired. I mean, we, we pretty much know that now. I think that's, that's, that's the evidence of that is strong. And so they're going to feel even more unlikely to want to sit in a classroom. So I think there will be a change. And if you look, by the way, at uh, India right now, which has a, an appalling education system for young people, um, you'll find that the big IT companies, Infosys, Wipro, TCS, are actually educating millions and millions of, of young people through some of the things they learned from the Open University, you know, i.e., how do you build courses, how do you get it to people in, in villages, and so you will see alternative education systems, and I've, although I haven't spoken about it today, I do think that corporations can play a really, really important role in education, and have to, because the skill gap is, is, is part of the reason we're getting high un, un, youth unemployment. Let's, let's take three questions together. In fact, there's a, there's a little knot of people there. There's three hands all together. They could pass the microphone between them. Simon Milton Pulse, uh, interested in your thinking. Is, an is there an elephant in the room in terms of short-term profit for yeah. big corporations? We hear about Unilever, we hear about 50% reduction in uh, CO2 argue they probably might have done that 10 years ago. So really, I haven't really heard how we're going to address that. Pass the microphone back. Thank you. Tom Levitt. I'm author of a book very complimentary to yours, uh, I'm delighted to say. Um, when 60 of the world's 100 biggest economies are corporates, not countries, when there's only 15 charities in this country with a turnover bigger than a single local superstore, and when governments are bound to four or best eight or ten years uh, planning horizons, isn't it the case that not just can corporations be a force for good, but they must be a force for yeah. good? Because unless they are so, then we're all doomed. Yeah. And then finally? Related to that, Travis Hollingsworth from Big Society Capital. Yeah. If you follow the impact investing movement more mm -hmm. broadly around the world, it defines impact investing as the intention to create mm -hmm. social impact. Mm -hmm. So to what extent do you kind of define this force for good as being intentional or more of a side effect of what businesses are doing? Well, well, they're good, aren't they, RSA fellows? They're, 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 brilliant. Bright, they, they? they're brilliant, actually. Thank you so much for those three questions. Um, I, I don't have, you know, an answer, obviously, because these are some of the world's most intractable questions, but I do have a couple of perspectives to say. The first is, and I mention it in the book, actually, I think the Aspen Institute has been incredibly forceful in terms, particularly in the US, actually, in terms of talking to companies about the timescale in which they have to report. And they've had some success because their view is that the ticking clock, as they call it, is the biggest problem that CEOs face. And so there are groups around the world who are addressing that. The second thing is that over the last couple of years, we at London Business School have attracted some of the top scholars in the world in terms of, unintentionally by the way, but nevertheless they're here, uh, the scholars who look at the relationship between uh, sustainability and corporate performance. Now, that research is large-scale research, so you have to look at you know, enormous numbers of companies and, in, and look at their sustainability record and look at their performance record. Uh, and what that shows is that, in general, corporations with strong sustainability records also outperform those with low. Now, that, in a way, shouldn't be a surprise to us, because that's the mark of a good corporation. And why do corporations make profits? Well, they make profits because every one of us here has a pension, and we expect the pension to provide some sort of revenue. So, you know, these are complex systems, and I, I don't think that there's any single intervention that can make a difference. But I do think, and Matthew and I were talking about this before we, we came on today, I do think that there are a, a growing number of stakeholders in different parts of those systems, like the Aspen Institute, who are looking at short-termism, like you know, the work that, but in fact, both of you are doing in terms of big society and 
uh, and investment communities. I mean, at Davos this year, there was a whole bunch of investors who sat around talking about how do we make sure that we invest in sustainable businesses. Now, one could say that's PR greenwash and so on. I mean, that's easy to say that, but okay, I'm not cynical, so that's probably one of my disadvantages <laughs> as a writer. I don't have a, enough cynicism to say, oh, it's just about PR, but it seemed to me, listening to them, that they were pretty genuine. And I do notice in my M L L LBS class, and friends from Wharton and Stanford and Harvard are saying the same, that, that if an MBA, it, many of our MBAs will choose corporations because of what they're doing in the world. Now, you know, will they take a massive drop in salary and still choose them? Some of them won't. But certainly, they are factoring that in. So I'm pretty, I mean, Matthew and I were talking earlier, and he's less heartened than I am about this, but I feel... No, 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 no. I think my, my, my concern, Linda, is that, is that individual corporations have a strong story, but it's the system as a whole that's not changing. Oh, yeah. I mean, and I think that's particularly an issue in relation to climate change and sustainability, where yeah. every corporation seems to have a strong story, but yet the global system has not changed at all in terms of what it's generating. Oh, I totally agree with you. I mean, I think it's deeply, deeply worrying. I mean, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Anthony Giddens, who I think is one of the great, you know, British thinkers, all of his work this, these days is on climate change and stakeholder um, work because it's very clear that we as humans are not capable of working on complex problems. And the biggest complex problem we solve, we face right now is climate change. And I don't have any answer to that. I really don't. All I can do is pick a tiny part of that complex stakeholder thing and say, actually, large institutions need to be held to task, not in a negative way, but in a way of saying, it's possible for you to do something about, to play your role in this. But I agree with you. I mean, I, I find it terribly distressing to, hit, to know about climate change. We, we at London Business School haven't really, I mean, we do have professors who tackle that, but one of the things that I do on my elective is I ask Shell Oil, because they do really incredible scenario planning to come in and talk about scenarios. And one of the scenarios they, sh they show is, um, is you know, the, the number of degrees that the world is increasing in terms of, of, of temperature. And the big figure is two degrees, because so, pretty much all, everybody now agrees that two degrees is where you get these incredible system changes. And they show you know, the positive scenario and the negative scenario. And the negative scenario means that you get to two degrees by 2040, that's in the lives of many of us and all of our children, and that's the trajectory we are currently on. And, you know, I mean, that's what we talk about at London Business School these days. And I think that, and this is what I call the world view, I think everybody needs to understand that. And, you know, I'm 60 next year. I, I, I like, you know, many of you don't want to leave a world which has created so many problems with so few solutions. So, you know, I, I totally agree with you. It's, it's, it's the most, it's actually the most worrying problem that humanity so, you know, faces right now. Let's take a final three yeah. questions. So I'm going to take the lady there, I'm going to take the gentleman right at the back of the room, and then I'm going to take the gentleman at the far left there. And I'm sorry for those of you that I haven't chosen. Um, Anita Panani fellow in terms of uh, you touched on networking in terms of people communicating one of the challenges is there are cultural differences whether the the global or the national or the uh, the organization have you any thoughts in terms of your research as to what makes for a, a good culture um, and whether individuals are increasingly becoming somewhat Americanized I mean, we touched on some of the education leading education thinkers are from um, American colleges. Yeah. Okay, uh, hold that yeah. one. And Sorry. then there's a gentleman right at the back of the room. Why don't you just, oh, you got a mic. Yeah, go on, go. Good afternoon, my name is James Adeleke. I'm Managing Director of Generation Success, and I'm a commission on a cross-party supported youth enterprise report. Um, my question is regards to solutions and finding innovation. Um, in my experience, the most, in terms of the next generation of employees and leaders, um, the most entrepreneurial minded use are not seeing corporations as places for them to go to and work. Yeah. Um, in regards to corporations finding solutions and, in, and innovating, they do need these type of people. What can they do to start attracting them and seeing them as a viable option? Yeah. Great, thank you. And then, yeah. 
Hi. Um, it's fine. On. Hi. Uh, it's Anoop Maney. I'm a um, social reformer in healthcare. Um, there's a famous saying that what gets measured gets managed, the Peter Drucker quote. And there's another quote, which is uh, from Mahatma Gandhi, which is, be the change that you want to see in the world. And I've kind of put the two things together and that measure the change you want to see in the world. And I just wonder whether there's something or, or what perspectives you have about what things we could start to measure which might help corporations to be a greater force for good. Mm. Brilliant. So yeah, how great. do corporations kind of deal with the communication in different cultures? How are corporations going to attract bright young people who don't want to work in big bureaucracies? And how do organizations really, really focus on the stuff that matters? <laughs> and you've got, uh, you've got four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so, so the communication one. Um, you know, one of the really fascinating things about this young generation is that they're, they're the most jo joined up generation that there's ever been. So uh, we've done um, a big study of 60,000 around the world. And what you find is that um, they're more like each other than they are like their parents. And, and I think that's a really, really important you know, position. And that doesn't matter what country they're in. So, so you are, and that's a technologically enabled thing. So you are beginning to get a, a community of people who are global. Now, how that plays out, I have absolutely no idea. But it is really interesting. And, and, and I agree with you that they seem to have some of the same aspirations. Um, Yes, I, I was just about to do a little thing about China and consumerism, but I, I'll, I'll hold, you know, I won't go there. But, but there are some very worrying parts about that as well, of course, in terms of how you join up the world if it becomes a, a, a joined up consuming society. Um, I think um, the, the question, your question was about... Young people don't really want to work in big bureaucracies. Yeah, well, so how do these well, organisations attract people? Well, I mean, there's, you know, I think some of them do. I, I mean, it seems to me that there's a lot of places for people. And, and what we notice at London Business School is some of them join large companies and some of them start their own business. And I think both of those are very good choices. I don't actually have a particular view. It depends on what you're interested in. You know, if you take the professional service firms or you take the big advertising agencies, and we have some of you in this room today, or you take the big creative industries, and we have some of you in this room today, these are great places to work. I mean, the, you know, the UK has some of the best professional service firms in the world. Why, why wouldn't you want to be part it's of it? It's part of the story, just very briefly on that, that, that corporations have to focus on how they can provide genuine aut autonomy for their employees. Because one of the reasons that people, young people, want to set up their own business yeah. is they want autonomy and they want freedom. So corporations have got to provide that autonomy and freedom. For Not their, necessarily. No? no, I mean, one of the things I'm increasingly view, uh, clear about is that these are deals, and I think corporations need to be clear about the deal. If you want a lot of autonomy, don't work for a large company. And actually, by the way, I think corporations have been led into, you know, partly through PR speak, being, uh, you know, m much more sort of mealy mild about what the job is. Uh, you know, investment banking. If you want to be an investment banker, you have to work all the time. You won't see your children, but you'll be paid a lot. That's the deal. So why don't, that's it. So, I, you know, it seems to me that you, if you want a lot of autonomy, I, I, came, I came out of a large corporation into London Business School. I took a massive cut in salary. I mean, really enormous. And I did it because I wanted autonomy. That was the deal that I, that I struck. So if you want to be autonomous, don't work for a large corporation. corporation. Start your own company. Now, that, by the way, as you know, doesn't also lead to a lot of autonomy. But, but I think, you know, corporations need to be clear about what the deal is. And when you, and when you go to a company, you need to find out what the deal is. Because these are always trade-offs. And, and I'm very, I, as I, you know, understand corporations more deeply, it's all about trade-offs. What about measuring the difference you want to be in the world? And I think this is a really, really good question. And thank you so much for that. Um, and actually, if you look at... Uh, some of the work that my colleagues at a London Business School are doing, they are really, really putting metrics in place. And, and it seems to me that one of the things that we've got to do, and Aspen, as you know, have been, uh, as I'm sure you know, are, are leading the field on that, is encouraging companies to report what they're doing in some, in some key areas. So I, I totally agree with you. And I think as a consumer or as a potential employee, unless you see those metrics, it's extremely difficult to come to a conclusion about what companies do. One of, the, um, one of the things I feel very nervous about in terms of being a researcher is to write a case and publicize that case and then find out that actually 
that it's tiny. I mean, nobody does it. It only happens in one tiny part of the company. And, and so I agree with you that metrics are a much better way of finding out what's happening than um, writing one case. So, so one of the reasons, what, by the way, that Standard Charter Bank got into my book, you know, was because the figure, 31 million, is a big figure. And that's, that's, a, that's a figure that, they've, that is a reliable figure. So, so I totally agree with you. I think numbers are, re data is really important to this. Great. Well, thank you for some really fantastic <laughs> questions. Much, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Linda, I can tell you, writes with the same clarity and in the same engaging way as she speaks, <laughs> and that should be enough to encourage you to <laughs> grab a copy of her book, which will be available, which is available outside, and come up and get Linda to sign it as well. But uh, just for now, before you do that, can I ask you to join me in thanking Linda Grapp? Thank and thanks to you very much.